There are very few draft prospects this year that both excite me and scare me like LSU's Devin White. Sometimes when I watch him, I feel like I'm seeing the second coming of Patrick Willis out there making jaw-dropping plays all over the field, but then two snaps later he'll make a terrible mental or technical mistake that reminds me just how raw he still is as a linebacker and how far he has yet to go before he becomes a finished product. It's all extremely high peaks and extremely low valleys when it comes to evaluating White's potential, and to be honest, I'm still not entirely sure how high he should go in the draft. Philosophically speaking, should teams value those peaks more in their final grades, or should they consider the valleys? It's a very legitimate dilemma both for them and myself, and truth be told, a lot of the time it just comes down to a gut feeling. So to help steer my gut in the right direction towards an answer, let's first start by breaking down his unique strengths as a player, and then we'll work our way back to his weaknesses. First things first, White is easily one of the fastest linebackers over 230 pounds that I've studied in the last several years, perhaps only rivaled by Ryan Shazier and Jalen Smith before their respective injuries. He moves at a completely different speed than everyone else on the field, and it's not hard to imagine him sliding into more of a run and chase kind of role as a will linebacker in the NFL so that those physical gifts can shine as much as possible. From that position on the weak side of the front, he can worry less about setting edges or taking on blocks at the point of attack, and more about just straight up racing people from sideline to sideline in pursuit of the ball. And believe me, when he's in a foot race to the sideline, he rarely loses. That kind of speed isn't just important for snuffing out runs to the edge before they even get going though, because it also helped him to stop the bleeding on some already good gains before they turned into even bigger gains down the field. Big plays are always going to happen no matter what, of course, but when you've got a linebacker that can run 4-4 on your team, the usual angles that ball carriers take to burn defenses get more easily choked off, and those runners no longer have those one or two extra steps worth of space to break free. White's speed against angles like that has often been the difference between LSU giving up a 10-yard run and a 20-yard run, and all those clutch tackles add up to a huge amount of yardage saved over the course of a game, and obviously over the course of a season. But being able to run like a deer and limit big, game-breaking plays isn't the only thing that makes him an intriguing prospect, because there are lots of linebackers in the league that are blindingly fast. Maybe not as fast, of course, but still fast nonetheless. There are not a lot of speedy linebackers, however, that also have enough strength and pop in their punches to quickly get off of blocks as they work their way to the ball. I made that point a little bit last year when I broke down Roquan Smith at Georgia, who was also a prototypical Will linebacker prospect that could really fly all over the field with ease, but as a consequence of his size, he struggled to take on blocks and quickly shed them when teams ran right at his gap. It was easily his biggest weakness on tape, and at the time I pointed out how the system he was in and the players that were around him would probably make or break him as a first round pick. White is different though. He packs a ton of power into that compact 240 pound frame to the point where even though his arms are not exactly long, he's so damn strong for his size that he's really good at stonewalling blockers on the second level and getting past them before they can dig him out. That's a rare quality for a weak side linebacker to have that already has rare speed to go with it as well, and that extraordinarily unique combination of speed and power is what makes him such an enticing prospect in the first place. The athleticism isn't just the main selling point with him, it is the selling point. But knowing that he is a top 1 percentile kind of athlete, it then begs the question, what's the catch? If he's faster than almost every other linebacker out there to chase down plays from behind, and he's also stronger than most Will linebackers to the point where he can hold up against pulling guards that are running directly at him, what is he missing? What's holding him back from me grading him the same way that I graded Shazier and Smith a few years ago, who I'll remind you I saw as both transcendent talents in each of their respective draft classes? To me, his two critical flaws that might end up being deal breakers for some teams are his instincts and his tackling technique. And I know that some coaches will see those things as more teachable than others, so it's almost impossible to determine just how big of a knock those problems really are. But trust me when I say there's a whole lot of linebacker coaches out there who are creating a checklist of all the shit they're going to have to fix if they take on White as a project. Remember that he only just started playing linebacker full-time less than three years ago because he was actually recruited as Leonard Fournette's and Darius Geis' successor at running back, and it's still very, very apparent that this is a new position for him. He still reads his keys late at times and misses assignments, he still blows angles and overruns his pursuit to the ball, which then leads to even more missed tackles, and even when he does actually get there with a good angle, he sometimes whiffs on tackles anyway because he wraps up too high and doesn't drive through the legs of his target. 
Like I said, there's still a lot of stuff to fix here, and at this point, he's probably more of an athlete than a linebacker. Whenever he wrapped up a ball carrier too high and his feet left the ground, he pretty much just said to the runner, okay, I'm gonna see what's stronger, my arms or your legs, and obviously the running back's legs won that battle most of the time because of basic physics, so he missed tackle after tackle after tackle because he wouldn't stop wrapping people up high instead of down low. Sure, sometimes that technique created a flashy tackle that resembled something like an alligator death roll, and it created a big play or two along the way as well, but the number of missed tackles and extra yardage that were generated by White's poor technique far outweighed those few highlights. The first, second, and third job of his future linebacker coach in the NFL, no matter what team he's on, will be coaching these bad habits out of him as a tackler and really getting back down to the basics on how to aim, how to wrap up, and how to make his tackles more reflective of his squat than of his bench press. I know that I can't get on him too much for it because, again, he's only been a full-time linebacker for a few years now, but still. If you want to be a starter in the NFL, you've got to be able to consistently tackle people without whiffing and without losing your grip. If you can't tackle, you can't play, period. It's just that simple in this league. But with all that being said, that's still not even my biggest question mark with White as a prospect, because on top of his technical flaws as a tackler, he's still trying to develop and figure out the one thing that makes all great linebackers great, instincts. When you watch White work his way through traffic and find the ball, to me it looks like he's sometimes reading the play like a running back rather than like a linebacker. On those snaps, he reads the leverages and the gap fits of the defensive line in front of him to spot a cutback lane just like a running back would, and then he uses that read to make essentially an educated guess about where the running back is going to go. Sometimes it obviously works and he'll flash into a hole or get into position against a cutback extremely quickly, but then other times when he guesses wrong, he'll look completely lost and have no idea where the ball is or what gap he's supposed to be in. Even against similar formations with similar play calls and similar reads, you never really know if you're going to get the Devin White that looks like a future All-Pro or the Devin White that looks like a future backup because he doesn't consistently read blocks like a linebacker. I'll use this play from early in the Arkansas game as an example. As a linebacker, your job on every play is to read what's called the triangle, because there are three aspects to every read that you've got to pay attention to simultaneously. The line, the quarterback, and the running back. Arkansas is running a power play here, so we've got everyone down blocking and trying to create lateral movement one way, with a pulling blocker going the other way to kick out the Mike linebacker at the point of attack and create a seam inside for the runner. White's one job against power is to defeat the block that is trying to pin him to the backside and then scrape over the top of it to the front side where he can then position himself next to the Mike linebacker, who again is taking on that pulling guard, which of course means that the only free body left to actually make the tackle is White himself. He has to get to that spot on time so that he can then fill the lane because nobody else will. It's about as critical a read as it gets for a linebacker, and truth be told, if you've got a great Mike and Will tandem that know how to fit their gaps on time, no matter how physically talented or untalented they are, power runs will pretty much never work against them. It's really a play design that is more about positioning and angles than it is about raw strength or speed, and so when Arkansas popped this run for a big gain, it was really because of White's lack of experience with gap discipline more than it was about anything else. Check out how he diagnoses this play again. He reads the triangle decently well off the snap, he sees the guard pulling to his left, the quarterback is in a reverse pivot, and the running back is also starting to bend in that same direction to receive the handoff, so he's starting to step in that direction to get to the front side of this play in response. So far so good with reading all of those keys. However, as he starts to look for the pin block coming his way, his eyes get stuck on the one thing he should not be reading, the defensive lineman in front of him. He glances at his 5 technique here, Glenn Logan, to see where he's leveraging himself against this down block, and in White's mind, the running back is going to be cutting off of Logan's leverage if he flashes too far into that front side gap. So if he thinks that Logan is too far to the front side, he wants to stay in the back side to be in position to handle any cutback because it will be wide open. But here's the thing, handling that cutback is not his job. He isn't supposed to be reading his own D-line to make a guess about where the running back might go. He's supposed to be getting to the front side to fill that lane because that's where the running back will go if he doesn't. And if the runner ends up cutting into that backside lane anyway when he fills the front side, oh well, it's on everyone else to deal with that. But he's not the guy to make that tackle on the cutback. When your eyes get stuck reading something you're not supposed to read against a power run, you're screwed. It kills your whole defensive front instantly. 
You have to be in the right position if you want to stop this play because the only way it will have success against a three down front is if you allow it to have success with poor gap discipline. And what's really most frustrating of all about this play is that he does not always make this mistake. There are plenty of power runs, not just from Arkansas, but also from Florida and Bama and every other team they played against this year where he does read the triangle all the way through the play and he does defeat those pin blocks easily and use that speed to get into the hole faster than almost any other linebacker I've ever seen, and he does make a secure tackle and look like a top five pick. But it's not always like that. His inconsistency with reading plays like a linebacker and not just guessing all the time is extremely frustrating, and when you package that together with his inconsistency as a tackler, I genuinely have a lot of conflict with where to value him as a prospect. The ceiling we're talking about here is literally being a Hall of Fame caliber talent, but on the flip side, his floor is pretty damn ugly in its own right. I'm sure his true career path will lie somewhere in between those two extremes, but honestly, his destiny probably all comes down to where he gets drafted, who his coaches are, and who his mentors are in the locker room. To me, if he does want to reach that full potential, I don't think that there's a single team that is a more perfect fit for him than the Broncos. They're led by Vic Fangio, who might literally be the greatest linebacker coach in the history of the league, and I encourage you to look at some of the names he's worked with because his resume is absolutely insane, but they also have one of the better veteran locker rooms for him to learn from as well with Von Miller and Todd Davis as captains. I know that the Broncos may or may not still draft a quarterback in the first round this year because they still don't have a long-term solution at that position, but if they don't trade up for a QB, I could absolutely see them taking Devin White in the top 10 and letting Fangio work his magic to make the pick worthwhile. In fact, I would go as far to say that if White ends up in Denver, he's probably my early favorite for Defensive Rookie of the Year just because I like the fit that much. But if he ends up somewhere else, like say Cincinnati, who doesn't even have a linebackers coach on staff yet as of the time of me recording this, well, I'd be a lot less optimistic about his development. Make no mistake about it, despite his damn near generational talent, Devin White is one of the riskiest picks in this entire draft class. He doesn't fit every team cleanly, that much is clear, but to be honest, he doesn't really have to either. He just needs to fit one team, and hopefully the right team, to reach his full potential. As of now, still months away from his name being called and many years away from making a final judgment on his career, we obviously have no idea what he's going to be, whether it's a draft bust or as a bust in Canton. But knowing what we know right now, I can only hope for Devin's sake that he does end up in the perfect spot with the perfect coach. Because if he does indeed get drafted to the right environment to reach that incredibly high ceiling, mark my words here and now. This kid is not just going to dominate the game. He's going to change it. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode, and thank you as well to this week's sponsor, Vincero Watches. If you're one of the more fashion conscious among us, or you just really like cosplaying as Matthew McConaughey doing a car commercial and you need something to complete the look, check out Vincero because they make really high quality watches for both men and women. Every single piece is designed and manufactured and distributed directly by Vincero, so prices can stay as low as possible, and they only do small batch manufacturing as well, so they also never compromise on quality. I personally have the Kairos Blue, which looks great in pictures obviously, but as someone who has never actually owned a nice watch before because I have zero class at all, I was blown away by how good it looks in person. I chose that watch initially because I have an old blue suit that I wear pretty much anytime I actually need to wear a suit, and it matches it beautifully. Like, it elevates everything about this crappy old suit just by being on my wrist, and I was shocked at how well just one watch let me pretend that I have even a little bit of a fashion sense for a few hours. So I'm gonna wear that watch every time I wear that suit, and I actually also bought a few other outfits that go with blue just because I like it that much, and I kinda want more excuses to wear it, and it's kinda really opened my eyes in this weird way to actually like liking what I wear, so I, I really can't recommend it enough. If you want to check out Vincero's entire collection for both men and women, which believe me is extensive, and they have something that can match literally everything in your closet, click the link in the description below. And if you find something you like and you want to buy it, use promo code Coleman for 15% off your order. That is K-O-L-L-M-A-N-N -N for 15% off your entire order. 
It's a really awesome product and an awesome company. Thank you again to them for sponsoring. And uh, as for me, I will be back in two weeks with another Film Room episode. It's going to be a really big one. I'm going to be in New York next week, uh, all of next week, actually. So uh, obviously I won't be able to get another episode out during that time because I won't be home. But when I do get back, I'm going to be diving into these quarterbacks, uh, namely Haskins and Murray in back-to-back shows, so keep an eye out for those. And I'll also have my first mock draft of the year also out this week on my Patreon, exclusively for all Film Room patrons. So check that out as well if you haven't already. But uh, yeah, (laughs) that was a mouthful. I'll see you guys back in a couple weeks with some deep dives into these quarterbacks. And until then, later. Later.